Welcome uh, to this webinar on a data-driven future. My name is Mattis Ominen. Uh, I'm the chairman of the board at Gauta Foundation, as well as a professor of finance uh, at the Aalto University. Gauta Foundation is a foundation that supports research in the areas of business and in all technological fields. I'll take this opportunity uh, to thank the Alto team uh, for or organizing these webinars, uh, together with uh, Thomas Olku from the Kante Foundation. Why are we organizing these seminars is to bring together business people as well as researchers. Our hope is that our researchers uh, will get a better understanding of what is relevant in the business world, as well as we hope that business people will get a good understanding of, of how research is shaping, uh, shaping the future. So we start this seminar series with a seminar uh, uh, on data-driven future, and this will be, this will be uh, hosted by Risto Sarvas, one of the most popular professors at Aalto University. So at this moment, I just wish to welcome you all to this seminar, and I hope that you will enjoy this morning uh, with Risto Sarvas, who will introduce our, our uh, speakers next. Thank you, Matti, for those words, and good morning to everybody on my behalf as well. Like Matti said, my name is Risto Sarvas. I'm a professor of practice at Aalto University, where my job is the director of the Information Network's master's and bachelor's programs. And today's theme is data-driven future, and a little bit more about that in a few seconds. But before we start, actually, uh, our talks and the speakers. Just a reminder to every one of you that we need your help in this as well. So there in the screen, you have the opportunity to ask questions in the chat. So please do that during the talks or after the talks when we have short Q&A sessions. So today's theme, uh, to give an introduction for this morning, is data-driven future. And the first thing I'm actually going to do with you here today is to change a little bit about that word. Because data, just like any technology in general, is passive. It doesn't do anything in itself. It needs something, somebody to do something with it. So when the question we start talking today about data-driven future is that if data, just like any technology, doesn't do anything, then who is actually driving? Who is in the driver's seat? And especially this morning, when we look at data, we look at algorithms a little bit broader. We don't look at the technology as such. We don't look at the business models. But we take a step back and we look at societies and we look at the societal influences of a data-driven future. Now, because the theme of this morning is more about societal level. So first, kind of think about, remind us of who are the traditional players in public discussions when we talk about the future of societies. And obviously news, established media are very important in driving the discussions of what is the future about and what are different decisions made about the future. Obviously politics, policies, they do play an important role. A lot of economics, macroeconomics, if you will, is in the discussions of what kind of societies, what kind of a future we have. But if we take those three traditional public discussion players, are they all in the current digital age that we live in? So who is in the driver's seat if these three traditional players are not the only ones, especially I would say that these traditional players seem to be very reactive to the changes when it comes to technologies such as data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so forth. So we all know typical examples, I would almost say schoolbook examples of these reactive uh, ways of behaving are, let's say, platform business models or ethics in artificial intelligence or from a regular point of view, competition law. That if we look at this, we look at the public discussions, we look at how these established societal discussion players are working, it's, we get this feeling it's more about reacting to those technologies, to those business models that seem to be 
coming from somewhere that seem to be happening. So the question is, who are then shaping the data, future societies we have? And perhaps the answer is obvious. And I think it, in a way it is obvious, but nevertheless, <laughs> in the past years when having these discussions, is that we need to keep reminding of us of who are the, sh who are the shapers, who are the drivers. Because of course, an important role is in the organizations, in the professionals who have the know-how, who have the expertise, who have the infrastructure, the networks to leverage and to create business, to create innovations with data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, high technology and so forth. And why perhaps we need reminding ourselves of this almost obvious thing is that I would say that perhaps these experts, these coders, let's say designers, business people, they don't necessarily see themselves as actively shaping society. If you look at the history of these professions, it is quite obvious that they have not been seen as socially active players. Their kind of professional identity is about creating those business models, algorithms and technology. And when we look at organizations who shape these discussions, who are in the driver's seat about future, do they really want to engage in societal discussions? Do they want to engage in politics? Because once we step into a societal discussion set of mind, we are actually talking about politics. We're talking about policies. Nevertheless, these individuals, these professionals, these organizations with these capabilities, they do shape the discussions and they do shape the narratives about data, future and society. Because, first of all, they are the ones who understand the limits and possibilities of these technologies that often seem very cryptic. Often they, you know, they are treated as a black box because, you know, few people do understand what data means. What is the difference between data in an Excel sheet and a data in a data lake that requires certain expertise and understanding of what does it actually mean and the limits and the possibilities of those. But perhaps more importantly, these people, these organizations, they are the ones who actually concrete. They create the concrete working examples that shape the actual structures of our everyday life. Which at the end of the day is our society. When we wake up in the morning and we brush our teeth and we go to work, which might be in the garage nowadays, uh, it's that everyday life, working life, you know, home life, that's where our society is more or less built every day. And these professionals, these organizations, they create the society through, of course, the products, the processes, the services. And these things are, of course, created by engineering. They're created by designing. They're created by business planning. They're created by investing and so forth and so forth. Now, if we take that stand, if you are with me this morning and we take the stand that it's not the data that is driving us towards certain future, that is actually the people who do things with this data, do things with these algorithms, then if these professions, if these organizations are in the driver's seat, then I think a couple of very important questions start rising. First of all, what is their agenda? If they are the ones who have the capabilities and skills to take the technology and take the data, what are they doing with it? What is their agenda? And especially if we talk about organizations, commercial organizations, public sector, third sector, what are their goals and strategies? Where do they want to go as an organization and with the capabilities to leverage data and the possibilities of it. 
which actually very quickly boils down to questions that what are the values? What are the politics of these individuals? What are the values of these organizations? And I would say that this uh, resonates quite a lot with another discussion about purpose of business, you know, meaning, meaningfulness of work, the, the kind of new rise of individual values in an organization. Uh, it is a different discussion, but it overlaps with this, is that, you know, why do these professionals, when they choose where they work, I think there's a new trend about understanding the values and the purposes and even politics of the organizations they work for. But importantly, I want to also underline, and especially coming from Aalto University, where we, where we literally educate and teach these professionals, I think a very good question is that are they themselves aware, conscious, or even interested in this direct and indirect power they have in shaping our future societies? Are they actually, as professionals, did they <laughs> educate themselves? Is there, when they wake up in the morning, the professionals, are they going to work to do politics? Are they going to their, do their job? Do they think themselves of having societal discussions? And I would say, no, that is not necessarily the case. But nevertheless, whether people, whether these professionals and organizations are aware of their societal power, they do have that. So, to summarize, my agenda to be transparent in this spirit. So my agenda for this morning and the discussions we're going to have uh, with you over the chat and with the speakers coming up is that once we take the point of view that technology is passive, then the question becomes, okay, if technology is not in itself doing anything, if data in itself is not driving us towards the future, then who are shaping the data-driven future? Who are in the driver's seat? Who are in the driver's seat when we come to discussions about data, technology, society? Who are in the driver's seat in actually building the future? Who are the ones at the end of the day that have their fingers on the keyboards? And through that, who are the ones who create the examples in the public discussions and for all of us that what is actually possible about the data-driven future? What are these individual professions? I mentioned a few of them. Programmers, designers, business people, entrepreneurs, investors. I think those are quite obvious. What are the organizations? And out of those organizations, what are the big ones? What are the small ones? What are the medium-sized ones? Are they consciously shaping the society or does it happen as a byproduct of their own strategies and goals? And last but not least, what are the networks, what are the ecosystems, or what are the industries that are driving towards their own goals, that are implementing their own strategies, and also have the capabilities to take advantage of the high technology, of the data, of the AI, of the machine learning, and so forth. So that's my introduction to the theme this morning. We're going to have, in addition to myself, two more speakers, two more perspectives, two more opinions into this. And hopefully, like I said there, also share your opinions. It doesn't have to be a question. Share your thoughts, share your comments in the chat that we can see here and we can take into the discussion after each speaker we have today. So to continue from this, our next speaker is uh, Eero Korhonen, who is the head of strategic relationships at Google. And I'm sure we're going to have Eero soon here with us. Good morning, Eero. Good morning, Risto. How are Thanks things in... Opening and... Yeah, how are things in London? Well, it's very uh, early here, 7 a.m. And <laughs> this is the first time I'm speaking before waking up. So ah. otherwise, all right. Okay, are people lining up for those vaccinations there? 
I think so. I think so. Yeah, we started yesterday, so quite exciting. Probably taking for months, months to come before everybody has received their own ones. Okay, but that's not the theme of today. We're talking about data-driven future. Nice to have you here, Eero. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Risto, for the intro. And, and thank you, Kaute Foundation for and Alto University for inviting me. And, and again, good morning, everyone. It's really good to be with you here. And I'm really excited about the event and I'm looking forward also to the discussion with Mary and Risto after the presentations. I'm checking, yes, the technology works here, uh, remote control from London. Uh, as Risto opened as well uh, this morning, the, I'm probably not the good guest here, just starting to tweak the title of the event, but I, I've also felt a bit the same that data-driven indicates that the data is in the driving seat. However, for me, that it sounds better that it is data-supported world because it is other things that create are driving the forces and the support indicates more that it helps us to, uh, to open new opportunities and, and, uh, and make better decisions, decisions based on the data. Like in this photo from Stockholm's Sheps Holman, somebody might be walking the same, same shoreline there. It is early morning in the data supported uh, future. There's a lot of buzz around AI and ML, and it makes sound like all of us or everyone is now coding with Python as we speak. But if you try any customer service bot, that pretty much proves the point that there's so much things to do before it, we are really far away. There's some basics I wanted to take in this, uh, start this presentation with. First of all, the data, this may sound trivial, but the data is not the finished product. It is just the raw material. Uh, you often hear the claim that when you have the data, that as such is creating the value and is somehow the magical source of, of a uh, business model. I don't see the slide changing here. I'm pressing again, so. Now, there's a small delay. The data needs is to be structured and transformed uh, before, and, and transformed to knowledge before it becomes useful. The right combination and continuous development of tools, skills, and processes is the key. This is a multidisciplinary effort by the Foundation and other University as an institution. So regardless whether you look at it from a research or technology or business perspective, you have to involve many others uh, to the process of refining. Successful fine refining is, requires orchestrations, orchestration, and that is not a trivial at all. I take an example from company I work with. This is Google's mission. It has stayed the same since we started. And like in the previous picture, the value added, even stated in this mission, is not about the data as such, but it is the process of organizing the information and making it universally accessible and useful. In our case, we make the, the websites on the open web available for and accessible for our users when they are relevant for them in their particular moment. And this is probably the reason many of the users return many times day to the site. Also, this user intent type on the search bar with additional data points makes the Google search relevant for businesses offering their services and products. You know it pretty well. I give some examples about the orchestration behind. So the orchestration of Google search, obviously, we can guess it, it's not very trivial. What worked for users some time ago doesn't work in the future. The data supported consumer services are in general never ready. They need continuous adjustments. For example, 
15% of search queries are new every day. Our interest change continuously. We not only type the search queries, we also started to use natural language and, and later on, uh, later on also voice. In order to keep Google search relevant, we change the algorithm roughly six times a day, which act equals roughly 2000 changes a year. And this, however, requires about 200 to 300,000 experiments per year. So there are many ideas and experiments that will never go live. If you want to mo know more about search, there is a just recently uh, released one hour movie about Google search. So like if you have a uh, free time in the evening or in the week and like a, it's quite entertaining for a person even working in the company. I take some examples from the news industry, which is a uh, industry I've worked for past 20 years. Uh, I've have had the privilege to work news publishers across the European continent and, and seeing their development to a uh, uh, from it legacy publishers to a data driven publishers. They have been going through a massive change in the industry because of the consumer behavior, which is driven by the digitalization available like and, and making available new sources of how to, how to spend time. Past two to three years, things have really changed within the industry. Rhys just mentioned that the publishers have been very reactive in, in the topic of data-driven, data-supported future. But true, that's true, but things have really, really changed a lot. A growing number of publishers are showing a uh, healthy profits and that those are specifically coming from data, uh, the, the data-driven consumer revenues. And it's fair to say that many of these successful ones have taken a massive leap uh, when they have changed their organizations and, and skills. This is a proof for me that understanding the opportunities are expanding uh, beyond the tech sector, universities and startups, but like also for more traditional industries. Based on this, this work with the news publishers, I give a couple ideas about the criteria, success criteria, what I see with the successful ones. I have four of them. Three of them, obviously, only in this slide. One of them is a, uh, obviously, a uh, culture and way of work. Data sub supported organizations can't have silos. Successful organizations, successful publishers I work with, they have not only brought together and combined the data from different sources for refining, but they also have brought together the people from different organizations, different units, in publishers' cases of diff from different publications. Successful public publishers have formed teams and acquired talent from universities and outside of the news industry, and, and they have brought new skills to the organizations I didn't see 20 years ago. They didn't exist in news industry. These publishers make new tools, they whether do it in-house or with vendors, but they are building learning models to estimate propensity to subscribe, personalizing front pages for you, and recommending content in order to acquire you, uh, subscribers, but also manage churn. It is, I'm quite happy to say that the Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, they are very ahead of, of this transition. One more skill Success criteria is important when the slide changes now is leadership. All of those publishers that have shown successful transition from a legacy publisher to a data-driven, profitable, consumer revenue-driven publisher, I think the leadership has played a key role. It's not easy to change a business that has been similar for 500 years. Uh, they have been removing organizational and technological silos. They have driving the change of culture. They have ex like uh, introduced a culture of experimentation and they have been able to hire skills that never been seen there, there before. I dare to say that even though these are examples from the news industry, it is likely to be similar for other industries as well. So if you are a leader, 
in an organization and you when you return today to the office or your home office and you feel that I don't see a change to the digital uh, data supported future, it is likely to be up to you to start. It. So uh, I think these are useful uh, set of criteria for other industries as well. And changing slide, hopefully happening here. Okay. The organizers asked and laid the, 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 the even today that what data can change and, and what could add value for society. First of all, I feel data supported future is not limited to any specific sector. We will see innovation and application helping us across the board. Any industry is probably seeing something coming from, from uh, data supported innovations. Today, however, I selected three sectors that are likely to get a lot of focus within the societies for good reasons. I give an example from energy sector, food production and, and life sciences. Uh, I'm fair to say that I'm not expert of all the details of the project, but I think they will give you an idea that, about the direction and, and the, the, the sentiment of experimentation that is going already. I start from a uh, energy sector. This is something Google has done together with a uh, many industry players. It is called environmental uh, environmental insights explorer. And what? No, I just lost my remote controller here. This is sometimes a bit difficult when you are outside. Uh, environmental insights explorer. So it's part of our pledge to help 500 global cities to reduce one gigaton of carbon emissions annually by 2030. The tool estimates, first of all, building emissions within the city boundary. From Google point of view, the data is taken from Google Maps. However, it's of course combined with other models that allow to estimate that how, what are the uh, emissions in, in buildings in this region. It also estimates the transmission, transport emissions of all trips that start from the city boundaries or end there. And this is based on aggregated and anonymized location history data. Last, as you can see on the right hand side, this is a small box. It also estimates the solar production potential of all buildings based on sunshine, exposure, weather patterns, roof size, and roof orientation. The data supported world requires a lot of data refining, and the data centers require a lot of energy. In 2017, Google became the first company of our size to match 100% of its electricity consumption with renewable energy. Our ambitious goal is also going a little bit further to make it that we are 24 seven carbon free uh, anywhere at all times by 2030. That, we, that means that we are aiming to always have our data centers supplied with carbon free energy. We have developed, uh, developed algorithms that are uh, we, we've been able to reduce our ed energy consumption when we cool down our uh, data centers by 30%. We are also making those uh, algorithms available for the, uh, for the other players in the industry. It's not only about Google. I give an example from Finland. Nuka Solutions, which is an amazing name for a uh, company that tries to uh, help real estate building, uh, real estate portfolio managers to reduce energy consumption uh, uh, and helping to build a uh, healthy or environment in there uh, for, for the people using. Nuka, Nuka is using also machine learning driven algorithms to help their customers. Their customer, uh, they, and they are sharing this through their platform and, and making a uh, models that would help a uh, large portfolios of real estate. This obviously seems to be very interesting because just recently, I think month or something, roughly a month ago, UIT, one of the largest construction companies in, in Finland, invested to Nuga to try, help them to drive their vision 
to make make a uh, life better and and more or less uh, and and more sustainable uh, for the re uh, real estate portfolio owners. This one is pretty interesting. This is my second last example of the uh, of the speech. This is a uh, experimental project called Mineral. It is coming from Alphabet's X Factor, which is also known as a moonshot factory. It, it starts from the premise that in the coming 50 years, the global need for food production is more than in the previous 10,000 years. And this should happen in a climate uh, when the climate change is making the crops less productive. The mineral team, they build new software and they design and build new hardware tools that can bring together diverse sources of information. They started by gathering information that's available already uh, about environmental conditions and soil and weather and historical crop data, how they are correlate, correlating and what are the causalities between those things. Furthermore, they started to use their own instruments to unearth new data, new data, how the plants in these particular fields were actually growing and responding to the environment. Combining this existing data and the, the collected data like plant height, leaf area, and fruit size with environmental factors, they can now help the breeders to understand better how different varieties of plants respond to the environment. This is early on experimental, but it also shows the diversity of opportunities that uh, data-driven and data-supported uh, future will likely bring for us. Again, yes, finally. Uh, and this is my last example. You might have read about it last week. First of all, I'm honestly not an expert of a uh, uh, what AlphaFold and DeepMind did, but I wanted to select this example because of the comments on the left left side. Deep, DeepMind built a dedicated interdisciplinary team in hopes of using AI to push basic research forward. They brought together experts from fields of structural biology, physics, machine learning to predict the three-dimensional structure of protein based on based solely on, on its genetic sequence. So as we started, definitely the right combination of skills and, and way of working. If you look at the comments, once again, this, but the spirit of the day as Risto started uh, his, in his opening speech is about the, the data informed and data supported. The refined data by now, uh, done by AlphaFold, opens new opportunities and helps us make the better decision faster. In their case, they accelerate research of biology and drug development. I see that there are four cornerstones on which the data supported future uh, will be built on. I know Mary will reflect in her speech from uh, her experience, some of these areas. Uh, I think some of these, are, or most of these are definitely general, but I will take a look at this from a Google point of view. People today are rightly concerned about the information, how their information is used and shared, yet they all define their privacy in their own ways. If, if you are in a family using internet, through a shared device, you, you might be all, the, the, your own privacy concern might be the one that you, you just don't want your family member necessarily see what you have been uh, doing and you want to keep your information secure. So a small business owner, privacy means keeping the customer data secure. To a teenager, sharing selfies, privacy could mean the ability to delete the data in the future. At Google, we have privileged that billions of people trust products like Search, Chrome, Maps, and Android to help them every day. And this trust we match with commitment to responsibility. For 
private users, we give very clear and meaningful choices around their data. And, and we have two very clear policies. We will never sell any personal information. And we always let the users to decide what do they do with the information. Inclusivity is, is also extremely important when you develop tools and products in the, your data supported world. AI algorithms and data sets can, data sets can reflect, reflect, reinforce, or reduce unfair biases. We also recognized Recognize that distinguishing fair from unfair bias is not always simple and differs across cultures and societies. So we will seek to avoid unjust impacts on people, particularly those related to sensitive characteristics such as race, ethnicity, gender, nationality, income, sexual orientation, ability of political or religious belief. In product design, we make sure that the underrepresented voices are being heard throughout the product development process from the early phases of ideation and prototyping to the UX design and marketing all the way to the launch. The product developers ask questions like, does it make sense for people living in different places around the world? Is it useful for people of all ages? And are all ages represented? Are all races represented in this product? Last, the sustainability we touched in an example as well. The data must be refined in an environmentally sustainable manner. Going towards a data supported future have to mean that actually it's better from the environment point of view than it is now. So we all today in this call, we need to keep this in mind when moving towards the uh, data supported one. This was my opening today. And if this click works, it says thank you and kiitos. Thank you, Eero. Always a privilege to hear uh, somebody from inside Google and sharing your perspectives on that. We have two questions in the chat. I'll start with a shorter one and then maybe a tough one. Uh, First of all, is the question that related to the Environmental Insights Explorer that you showed, why is this data not public for Finnish cities, cities in Finland? Uh, it's, yeah, so the service has been launched rather recently. So they are building the, the database as we come. So when we made the place for 500 cities, it is still ongoing, the process. So uh, you need to still stay tuned and, and follow up when, when there are other cities available. But not, it's not yet the all 500 cities there. Okay. Then the other one. Uh, we have a question that is data driven future. Is that a global mega corporation future? What do you want to say to that? I think the examples, like you, you, when you started also, you mentioned that there are, it is in the hands of, of few. However, if you see that how the tools and products and skills are expanding to all sectors of industries. There is an easier access to a your machine learning tools. There are easier access to skills. People are training themselves. I believe that we will see it from small companies to large ones. Uh, it is not in the hands of you. And, and this is built for everyone. And I, I believe that uh, Next few coming years, like Nuga Solutions, there in, as one of the examples, you will see a small companies coming up with the great ideas and great solutions that will be helpful for their own customer bases. Mm -hmm. And I do agree. There's a there's a balance between which is kind of stating the obvious that a, a company like where you work for has a huge power and in that sense responsibility about shaping future. But I also like the fact that you mentioned that actually sharing these tools, sharing the knowledge is kind of a democratization in a way that to have more people have more societal power is about education and giving tools and all that. And that can be said about Google as well, that it's a, one of the forerunners in, in sharing, sharing many of these things. So anyway, there, there is this, this balance, obviously, that I'm sure that has to be continuously discussed. Absolutely. Uh, 
Thank you, Ero. We're going to now go to our next speaker, and we're going to have you, Ero, back soon after that for a general discussion. So our next speaker, another perspective and a point of view to the uh, morning's theme, is uh, Mary Hataja. Welcome, Mary. Thank you very much. Thanks. And Mary, you are the CEO and co-founder of Sidot. Correct. And also you are the chair of IEEE's ethics certification program for autonomous and intelligent systems. That's a great name for AI. <laughs> that is, isn't it? <laughs> that's a great yeah. name, and that's a mouthful for a business card as well, I guess. Yeah, 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 it is. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, happy to have you here this morning. And stage thank you is very yours. much. Thank you very, very much. And I'm so excited to um, to have this opportunity uh, and uh, uh, talk after these uh, amazing uh, discussions that we heard uh, previously. And I, I particularly. Uh, Love that uh, Ero raised this, uh, for example, Alpha Fold, uh, the recent progress uh, in the AI that we have seen. And it's absolutely critical to start by discussing about the opportunities. Uh, that's the reason why we are in the data um, data business and, and, and changing our societies from that perspective. But let me expand this discussion with a couple more perspectives uh, so that uh, we have even more di diverse or like wider space to discuss the initial questions that Risto raised in, uh, in, in his discu discussion. So I will uh, come uh, or bring, bring on table uh, two, two, uh, two perspectives and sort of uh, want to point into one particular challenge that I see uh, is impacting how, how we drive this business and, and also raising that as a, as a question on table for people uh, who might have an influence on, on that one. So when we talk about impact uh, of AI in our societies and, and they, data or AI, uh, this whole space, uh, it's, it's very clear that uh, we are in a situation where uh, we start to, we really have impact, uh, impact in our societies. Uh, so, uh, so for all the examples that were discussed in Eros presentation are really, really proof for, uh, on that one that we are, we are doing many, many exciting things and, and there are opportunities on the table. Uh, that's also the reason, the, the impact namely uh, for that, uh, that there is this another perspective and, and basically when we follow what uh, what kind of impact we are creating, we see that sometimes this impact is something that we can rightfully say uh, it is not fair or just. And often these uh, sort of unintended impacts or something that is secondary or externalities to the uh, original impacts that we have stri uh, strive for, uh, is something that actually the people who have been developing and deploying these technologies haven't even seen or uh, been prepared for. So, so, so there's a lot of discussion about AI ethics and and how do we uh, how how people are thinking about the technology and and the directions. And we uh, we see a lot of concerns from the from the public on these matters. I took one picture uh, over here to uh, like this is from EU citizens on on uh, what people think about uh, about uh, deploying AI and what are the concerns that they have in this space. Actually, looking from the figures, uh, around sixty per. Uh, 60% of the respondents in, in Finland, for example, think that uh, in order to be able to respond to these ethical challenges of the new technology that we are driving, and specifically AI, we need public policies, so regulations for, for being able to, uh, to address uh, those ones. And when we ask about what are the concerns, what kind of like, uh, why do we need this kind of interventions or are looking for this kind of interventions, these are the things that are raised in, uh, in those responses. Responses. So uh, people are uh, concerned about the situations where, uh, where something harmful happens and basically uh, it, it would be unclear who is responsible for, uh, for those, uh, those consequences or uh, harmful impact. So it's about accountability and that's one of the, uh, one of the challenges that we have seen in this space, they, uh, like how to define accountability in this kind of uh, context is where we have like multiple different kinds of new players uh, contributing into, into uh, the development and deployment of technologies.
Another angle, uh, which was briefly touched by by Ero in his his talk, is discrimination and and um, uh, what uh, in terms of like different uh, is it uh, age, gender, race, and so forth. How are our algorithms working? Are we doing that kind of decisions that are actually fair uh, and non-discriminative, or do we put uh, some part of our society into into uh, worse position and even m like amplify already existing um, problems from, uh, from this perspective. Non-discrimination and, and, and fairness is one of absolutely most important and uh, uh, like most serious concerns in this space. Uh, also the agency uh, feeling that do we have a possibility to have an impact and, and uh, who do we contact if, if we have problems and is there a possibility to, to influence is also, also uh, one, one important angle. So this is, the, this is the voice of the people and like uh, the problems and concerns that people have for, uh, when, when we talk about the data business and, and, and data driven or data enabled supported future. Let's look at another perspective than that. If that's a, uh, that's what people think about these these things, then let's uh, let's bring on table one important angle which I feel that we too little discuss when when talking about data uh, data business AI driven businesses, and that's uh, what happens in the investor side. What has happened over the last couple of years is actually very very interesting and, and important from this angle. Uh, we have seen great raise, uh, rise of uh, what we call ESG investment. And ESG refers to, to factors, sort of non-financial factors or criteria, uh, environmental, social and governance related factors. Also in the same line, uh, and actually, yeah, uh, one figure on, on that one, uh, uh, 77, according to PricewaterhouseCoopers study on, on this ESG investment, 77% of uh, in institutional investors say that uh, they will actually stop buying non-ESG products. Uh, within the next two years. So that means that if these kind of factors, environmental, social or governance related factors uh, are not in the right position for a company, uh, institutional investors or the majority of them will not invest to these kind of companies. This is in the same line with uh, what happened last year when the Business Roundtable, that's a group uh, of uh, CEOs of nearly two, uh, 200 major US corporations, they uh, is uh, issued a statement uh, with a new definition for the purpose of corporation. And what is that purpose is basically challenging the, the old notation that uh, the purpose of corporation is to, is to uh, create value for the shareholders. In this new statement, uh, this group of uh, most powerful companies of, of US uh, say that the purpose is not only that one, but it's also to benefit the different stakeholders of a, of a company. That means employ employees, uh, customers and the whole society. So many, many interesting angles like happening on here. And the last one, uh, over, like during the, the pandemic this year, one more important change that has happened is basically when we look into this ESG uh, space and the different factors, environmental, social and governance, what has happened is basically uh, that uh, the importance of social factors have, have really significantly increased in comparison to the, uh, to the, uh, the previous emphasis on, uh, on uh, quite um, much on the governance and environmental uh, factors in the, uh, in the, uh, from the ESG perspective. So what I try to, try to uh, say with all of these, uh, these different um, uh, like points, data points from the investor perspective is that we are living times where social impact actually matters for uh, investors as well. And that uh, matters how the, how the financial ad, uh, markets work and, and how money is being directed to, uh, to our industries and companies. So how, how does it happen in practice then? Uh, let's continue still on this uh, investor perspective. When we are saying that basically there is an interest for uh, investors to invest in responsible companies, 
those kind of companies which actually consider the social impacts uh, of their businesses and the actions that they have in the societies. How does it happen in practice? This is long, long story, very short. There is basically an industry that is supporting investors uh, in doing this, uh, doing this analysis and, and figuring out uh, what, are the, what are the impacts that companies have uh, in, in, in the society. These are the players uh, that are providing uh, analysis, uh, ESG analysis for, for investors, uh, collecting uh, hundreds of data points related to different, different aspects, how companies are considering uh, environmental, social and governance factors, how they are managing the risks related to these, uh, these areas. And based on this analysis, uh, investors can can do uh, considerations and decisions whether whether uh, the angles that they they are concerned about uh, actually have been taken care of in a in an appropriate manner uh, in the in the companies. And now I'm getting into my uh, my really key points and and uh, let's have a look at. Uh, how do these criteria now look for? Uh, for Eero was discussing about uh, um, uh, communication industry, uh, publishing industry. Uh, this is actually an industry where Facebook and Alphabet, uh, Google, uh, were were uh, shifted uh, a couple of years ago uh, in this industry uh, uh, sort of categorization. So it's uh, it's good to look look into that one. And if if you see, I need to <laughs> check from here so that I see see the figures. Uh, what are highlighted with colors uh, on uh, on these pictures are basically the factors that uh, matter for this specific industry. This means that uh, if if a company uh, wants to perform well in the ESG ratings, if you come uh, from this uh, communications industry, interactive media and services industry, you need to do really well in these uh, specific factors, car carbon emissions, opportunities in clean tech. Uh, from the social aspect, we have privacy and data security, human capital development, that's about the em em employees. And then we have different uh, governance and board uh, Pay, pay related factors but my point is uh, is uh, is in uh, in this specifically when we look at this list what are the things from the social aspect that matter in these ratings uh, we we see a clear clear gap related to uh, to what are those uh, those um, impacts social impacts that we are actually concerned uh, of uh, when when looking at the the behavior of uh, of uh, these companies. So, so in practice, Twitter or Facebook, Google, none of these companies are basically evaluated. When there's uh, social responsibilities being evaluated, they are not evaluated by whether they discriminate or not, whether they create filter bubbles, for example, whether they have a contribution on misinformation or radicalization uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, ourselves and like people in general. These are not tailored into this, uh, into this criteria, which are used by the financial industry for doing decisions. What is, uh, what is a socially responsible company uh, or not? If we think about NVIDIA, one of the like uh, really uh, leading AI innovators in the semiconductors industry, they are not, uh, and they are actually selling for uh, their services for healthcare, for self-driving cars, and so forth. They are not, they are not evaluated basically for their product safety or discrimination-related factors. That's not part of the criteria. So uh, where I'm getting. Uh, when we look at the what what is the f um, what are the concerns in the in the civil society among the people when we hear the voices of the investors, we see that there is great willingness to take action, prioritize where we put our money and and like where we focus based on the social factors, uh, and that would be the answer for for the challenges that we have been. Uh, have been talking about when, when discussing about AI ethics. But the mechanisms that how we do these decisions, decisions haven't followed uh, where we have gone with the, with the data-driven businesses. So we, we don't have actually a right measurement for evaluating companies based on their impact. Uh, 
what is there is privacy and data security, but the things that actually are missing and what are the biggest uh, concerns in relation to AI ethics and why we are talking, why we are putting together regulations for this uh, area and so forth. Those are uh, mostly related to the risk uh, uh, with regards to health and safety, Human rights, there are so many different uh, angles in human rights, uh, non-discrimination, children's rights and so forth. Uh, and, and this like social impacts uh, at large, uh, how do we impact democracies, uh, misinformation and so forth. So my, my, my point and summar summarizing uh, this, what I'm trying to say and like put on the table is that uh, this is an opportunity. We, uh, we have investors waiting for uh, being able to direct their uh, their assets into uh, into sustainable sustainable companies uh, companies that actually consider all these uh, also uh, um, secondary and externalities uh, of th of their businesses. Uh, but we need to uh, need to really focus on on creating right kind of means to support this industry for for being able to understand how how companies are performing on. Uh, on, on these uh, matters that have now raised on table based on based on the the work that we have done uh, on on data and, and analytics. So this is my call for investors. Uh, this is also your responsibility to actually look into these criteria and measures how you are considering whether uh, whether the company is is actually uh, putting a, a reasonable effort on on. Uh, really managing the social impacts and driving for positive impact and, and also managing uh, the risks related to the negative impacts. And, and that's a good ground for, for uh, then, uh, then driving towards this more, more sustainab sustainable and, and, and good uh, impact on the society if we get this whole investment community to drive towards that direction as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary. And thanks so much. Appreciated finding the time to come here this morning. Absolutely, my pleasure. Sharing, <laughs> sharing all of this of expertise with everybody here. Um, we have one question there. I'm going to take that question and kind of spin it more towards your presentation. And, and we had a, from the audience, Ines asking about mm -hmm. who actually then shapes the shapers that mm -hmm. we started talking about this morning. But I really liked in your presentation, mm -hmm. you had the rating agencies mm -hmm. as kind of a very, uh, I hadn't realized this until hearing your presentation, but they have a very strong role as an intermediary there. And what they do is they take the raw data and then they summarize it and analyze it and mm -hmm. bring it on a silver tray. Uh, so obviously what you pointed out is that, that do, you, do you see that? You see that as a problematic? How, where, what kind of decisions and what kind of societies do these rating agencies want us yeah. to have? Yeah, I, I, I've, I mostly want to see this as an opportunity to actually... Um, uh, be, it's good to have that industry to, to be able to mediate this, uh, this work in, in, uh, like so that um, we need this means. Like it's in, impossible to do that analysis without this kind of uh, uh, players in place. But what I want to say is that, like you know, this is a call that uh, that we need to keep up with the pace uh, how the industry, the technology industry, is going. And now I feel that there is there is not really uh, a good connection still with the what we. Uh, talking the AI ethics, AI governance, and like the regulation that that whole space mm -hmm. and this uh, this rating uh, rating industry. So so um, I don't want to point any anyone on that one. I, I more of uh, see it as an opportunity, and we need to see that there is something there is a mismatch over there. And if we get to fix that, uh, that's a great opportunity to actually uh, get. A very powerful uh, stakeholder group, investors, uh, to drive towards this uh, same direction. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, take the theme of fair, fair society, a just society, on a broad mm -hmm. perspective. I found it really interesting that we have these rating agencies and also the investors. So, of course, kind of going back to my mer mm -hmm. my uh, mm -hmm. talk in the morning is that that what do they see as a fair society? Are they the ones, because as you said, mm. they had a huge leverage and power to shape where technology and business is going with investments. Mm -hmm. yeah. so it's kind of interesting that if these are the ones, 
who are putting their capital into certain visions mm. of society. Yeah. So traditionally that has been in the West a democratic process that mm. we kind of vote what kind of a society we have. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you yeah. see that? Are we now actually shifting to a to a discussions a, about democracy? Who gets to shape the future societies? Yeah, that's a. Uh, uh, That's one of the l- large societal impacts, like you know, and and like you know, how to rate whether a company is actually shaping democracy uh, with its technology. It's a, it's amazingly big and difficult question. I don't know how to how to answer that. But I think the first thing is is really to realize that this is not about privacy and data security only. That's not the 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 responsible data business. There are so so many other aspects, and and sometimes they even might be conflicting with privacy requirements. So the so uh, it's a great progress that we have done with privacy and and GDPR, getting privacy action or actually on table. And like there is no company who doesn't uh, doesn't see that we actually need to act on this one. In Finland, we have had like uh, calls for that one and crisis on on uh, on health data breach uh, lately. So there's a lot of uh, work to do there. As well but but uh, that point of view where we we uh, would only consider privacy and data security uh, as the only factor uh, on on AI ethics or like what is responsible data business is is very biased hmm. that's a good point uh, that actually reminds me of, of the ongoing news about the delivery of the vaccinations that the whole planet mm-hmm. is facing and reading how much that is actually a data based mm-hmm. and a data privacy exercise which I you know I hadn't realized until somebody had pointed it out that I just thought it's more of a yeah. physical logistics but it turns out it's very much of course logistics nowadays is very data yeah. driven and that's kind of a nice current immediate yeah. thing about society very concretely becoming this data privacy thing and what absolutely and, and and then think about the how data driven is the discussion about the vaccination hmm. and all the misinformation which were like really nicely analyzed by the broad, national broadcasting company just very lately uh, but uh, yeah it's all about data like how, how we shape people's opinions also about about these topics so so uh but data driven is also the investment business so we need to care about the data that is feeding uh the investment decisions mm. and that's maybe like well, my my call for for actually like figuring out more carefully that is this data that actually ma- measures the the social impact that we we are interested of mm. thank you uh let's take air Let's let's uh, take another shift into the conversation and bring Eero here. Welcome back, Eero. <laughs> Thank you. It's Thank nice you. to see that the sun is gradually rising in London <laughs> from the. It is very dark in the, the beginning. window there. <laughs> it, it's actually raining. You don't see the details. But <laughs> okay. Any any take on this? What we just discussed, or or what just Mary presented? Any any thoughts and comments from you? Yeah. I, I think that the responsibility and, and the investor angle is actually pretty important in, in, in this field because this is a, a growing field. There's a, more and more players. I, I think that kind of a understanding different impacts and, and as you said, like a, like a secondary impacts that sometimes might not be a so you like a, a positive. They, they should be understood, and of course, that should be also kind of understood by those who invest to the businesses and 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 work with, work with the businesses. Because it's not about investment; it also could be selecting partners. Who would you like to work with? Like, uh, what kind of a uh, impact for this company or other partner opportunity have a uh, for environment or a uh, uh, inclusivity and so on? So, I, I I really like the angle that Mary brought into this discussion. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And I think it's a good point to remind us we're also Kauta is a funding agency and organization, so that is mm-hmm. definitely an investment angle as there. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, we have a couple of questions from there. Um, Janna is asking us, what are the great success stories in ethical investment in AI? Investors are, of course, looking at return of investment, which kind of makes sense. That's their job. Uh, 
But how like successful investments that been ethical as well as good investments? Mary, anything come to your mind? It's a really hard question. I don't know if I have like enough uh, baseline from the analysis, especially that uh, for me this is uh, this is quite a new topic. Uh, and in, in, in general, uh, ethical investment. That's uh, the the yeah uh, ethical investment in in AI. Um, I think that's a that's an area for research. Also, like we haven't really we haven't really like dived into this. I have found very little information that that's, uh, that's why we have done like our own investigation on this area because because uh, the communities, uh, ESG community and the AI ethics community, they are totally separate mm. at, at the moment. So it's also this like when, when new things appear and like we uh, it comes from certain communities and, and it takes a little bit time that uh, we as a wider community learn to uh, learn to look at those same perspectives so uh so i i feel uh i'm not in a position like you know uh yet to 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 like bring these examples on table because uh, because this is very very new angle and i'm also like looking forward really to uh to have more research in this area mm. uh so so but if there are any any other persons in the com um, audience who would like to raise uh raise uh, comments or thoughts on that one definitely uh really interested to to hear Eero, anything come come to your mind success stories yeah, I, I are good examples like no, I, I think the success story is probably like appointing individual cases. It's difficult, but I, I think the whole concept of the, the framework of ethical investment forces that the players to actually think how do they behave, what, how do they build their services, what is their role in the society. I, I think there should be a probably, as Mary said, a research about that, how this ex existing framework of ethical investment actually impacts to the players do they design their products differently or do they behave differently when they know that there are opportunities that some investment funds mm -hmm. large pension funds for example invest to companies that actually behave in certain manners but in general i i i really think that the whole esg space and the race of uh rise of that uh, over the last couple of years and i know that there has been like you know years of work uh, people in the sustainability area and uh, like looking from the environmental aspects it's been hard work and for years and years it's not a new thing but like the boom that we have seen over the over the last uh, couple of years in this space and now it's actually like there is no investor who doesn't uh, doesn't know this space and like you know uh, isn't even sort of pushed or pressured to to have a stand on this one institutions who would say that we are not considering uh we are not inter interested about esg factors we only focus on the on the profit uh is not uh probably <laughs> a best move from the uh or like most attractive from a brand perspective so it's uh, it sort of starts to be a must have for investors and, and that's an opportunity, but that hasn't become, uh, you know, uh, by miracle, it's been a long process of, uh, you know, uh, creating tools and, and putting effort research and, and um, a lot of work for this area. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now it's opportunity for us to sort of like uh, 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 join forces with, with, with that, what has grown from the environmental perspective and start to also uh, use the same means for the social impacts. Mm. Well, I think let's take that as a good thing, what you just mentioned, mm -hmm. that you yeah. know, there is hardly an <laughs> investment organization who yeah. isn't at least I think forced, it's great, yeah. forced to think about these, these points. And we have another question from Rebecca. Could not the human technology interface be seen as co-constructive or relational rather than as a dichotom dichotomy of active versus passive? Excellent point, Rebecca. Um, I think we've been putting things a bit black and white for the sake of conversation. So I think that's a good point that rather than, you know, technology and human not being totally separate worlds, but actually having a continuous discussion, I think that's and being co-constructive. So how do you see if we, you know, let's take what I started with the 
kind of a black and white dichotomy. So how do you see that actually? What's the gray scale over there? How much do people shape the technologies and the data with their own behavior and vice versa? Any takes on that? Mary, you yeah. first and then Eero. Yeah. Um, one, of the, um, w- one of the really important principles uh, from the responsible uh, AI perspectives, transparency, and I've been like personally focusing on, on that one uh, very much. But it's fair to say that transparency from only that perspective that uh, we broadcast information for people and that's it, like you should trust <laughs> on, on, on what we build if we are open about that one, that's, uh, that doesn't sound that that's the, that's the whole picture and actually uh, what contributes to the, uh, to the trust in a way that we are interested to contribute to that. And I think that uh, the missing piece is the, the, the feedback loop. And, and like, how do we actually build technologies that are, uh, uh, in a broad way, uh, allowing a meaningful feedback from the users? And and how do we take into use that feedback uh, in in further developing our uh, our technologies? I think that's that's also very important from this trust perspective because people trust what they can be part of. So so. Uh, if we can actually, and this whole like one one of the concerns that I showed regarding uh, regarding the technology, that we have a feeling that uh, we cannot actually influence, and that's a bit pretty scary. If we ne- if we saw errors and we don't have a possibility to influence, uh, that's that's a scary sc- scenario. So so. I think I, I personally actually think that this whole, whole human technology in, uh, interactions and, and like interfaces, new interfaces for promoting uh, trust-based uh, relation between the technology and humans, explainability goes into that uh, space with what we are calling. So uh, it's one of the most in, uh, important and one of the sort of um, fundamental success factors for for the future of technology. So. I don't know any any thoughts mm. from Eero. Eero, take it from there. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, like, I, I gave an example during the presentation about like I see multiple angles. But if we take from the product development point, like uh, we're a company working in a global scale and like, having a uh, billions of users in different products, we have to take the feedback uh, loop when we develop new features or new functionalities. And it doesn't mean only relying on the data that we we get from the usage, but also really having different, uh, the people from different groups represent it, like when we develop the, the functionalities, whether it's Android or Maps or others. I, I, I think that's one of these things. The other angle is that we make, that you all can go for it and look from your Google account what what is what information there is and we have given the controls because that's one of the ways that we know that people can trust because they know that they actually are in control about the data that there is an opportunities to delete them and there's an auto deletion process that we don't also keep all data which is unnecessary to run the uh, product successfully that's I, I see that one of the angles of course, there's a lot of lot of more cases coming, like how the kind of a human interaction and the machines are combining. And then one of these, I think Helsinki Sanomat in Finland wrote like a week two ago, like some experiment where a uh, mobile phone camera technology was used to help a uh, blind person to, to to run without guides and, and and things like that. So there's a lot of innovations done together with with humans. Mm-hmm. Not yeah. sure did I answer that, but like it's a difficult one. Yeah, one more point to that. Uh, thinking of uh, some concrete means for how to uh, how to improve your uh, capabilities or like you know. Uh, position in, in uh, your capability to um, develop responsible uh, technology. Uh, the stakeholder engagement and the um, how your team is shaped, like who, what kind of people are developing is, is if you put effort on that one, uh, that you have a diverse team who has re- enough representation of the different kinds of groups that you are targeting uh, with your technology, 
bringing different voices and perspectives on table and you collaborate with the people who are actually users of your technology or like uh, indirectly influenced with your technology. Those are two probably most powerful ways and you know it like you know this is what design um, as a practice have have like you know uh, that's normal practice for them but now now introducing these as a means uh, to ensure ethical responsible technology development and an AI development is something that we clearly still need to discuss about because uh, because we are not living that that world yet but uh, it's very important. Yeah, and I actually, I take something. What, what Sorry, you're... I add here that the team, yeah, go ahead. The team diversity, this is ex- excellent comment by Mary, that the team diversity is extremely important. I wouldn't limit that to technology companies as such. I, I think anywhere in the societies, we should be like a really carefully looked at what kind of teams we have in place and, and, and do we see that the society from all angles that we need to understand. I, I think media companies, for example, they have been investing this a lot lately they because they tell stories to people they want to make sure that the, the stories come from multiple angle and they're considered from a di- from the diverse points of view and now bringing link to sir, sorry for my 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 earlier uh, point on the in uh, in the in the mechanism how we how we rate companies uh, what would you think if we would actually start to report the diversity of the AI teams not only the board or management team but the people who are actually developing these systems and 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 that's one one small item that if we would have if that would be something that we actually prioritize and are interested about and uh, and, and companies would start to report that kind of factor investors considering this uh, this uh, in their uh, considerations I think it would this, be interesting yeah. to see the impact because, uh, but this yeah, is what we are talking about. No one is measuring that. No one is sharing any any data about that one. But I, I think it's it's good time for companies to start preparing for that. I don't know what Google thinks about like, uh, and and if you even are sharing uh, already. I know that you have been putting a lot of effort on this one, but uh, but uh, as a practice, we are interested about uh, in reporting CSR reporting. We are interested about the board and management team com- uh, composite and also. Uh, maybe figures on on a uh, high level w- what is the gender uh, balance in the company but who are developing the AI uh, technologies no one knows I think that's that's that actually relates back to the what as far as I know actually when you go investing into startups mm-hmm. you actually invest in the team uh-huh. and I think traditionally it has sure. been the diversity of the team more as a technology design yeah. <laughs> business diversity yeah. Yeah. and now Kind of, if I'm optimistic, I see that there is this existing mechanism or way of thinking that we actually look into the team mm-hmm. rather than actually looking at what do they say that the final product is, mm-hmm. which yeah. is something you yeah. brought up that I made notes over here when you talked about the capabilities in a data future was experimentation, and I think that's a big major shift in in innovation and product development, mm-hmm. where we are not so much asking that tell me what your exact final result is, what is Mm -hmm. the final innovation, because uh, you don't know yet, but we're looking at your capabilities of experiment, and now you're kind of bringing forth of looking at the diversity of the people, and perhaps going back to what I said earlier, looking at the diversity of what different values these people represent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's an like absolutely important point. This whole learning, learning by doing, and like and 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 basically the interest. We should measure how capable this company, how interested a company is to uh, recognize all the impacts that they have, how they are managing, they're uh, improving their capability to have this sort of ethical foresight uh, into into what will be the impacts, but also how how agile how how reactive they or like you know how do they adjust based on what they learn because no one can claim that we we would be able to see what are the impacts these are complex technologies and society is complex people are complex when we put to- those together it's a fact that we 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 need to be able to take feedback quickly and and, and adapt how we work so that's also like i think really important and and we shouldn't even try to strive for that kind of situation that 
okay, we know all the impacts and like we, this is ethical. We have managed everything. That's that that's false because that cannot happen. But but are we prepared? Are we interested to actually see what are the impacts and actually then take action when we see something that that um, that requires action? So somehow that should uh, I feel that that's really important in in how we address this and how we also evaluate companies. Uh, 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 contribution and, and capability to manage uh, the social risks. We, we, we do, Mary, report the diversity, like, of course, high level, but there is an annual diversity report publicly yeah, available. Yeah. And, and, there's a kind of, so they, and so what you suggested, I, I think, is something that every company should do, like really be open about it, like what kind of people are like building the tools as you said so that at least gives a hint like a like a hint how, how who we are hiring what kind of a backgrounds they have what is the, yeah. the constellation of the organization of course it doesn't go probably in the de- team level as you suggested mm-hmm. like a, yeah. how those particular yeah. teams are but uh, i i think we, we 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 need to keep it very open considering the, the global scales yeah also one one thing that i i would really like to like to bring on table still is that uh sustainability leaders are of the companies are in a key position and I, I i feel that not all of them have figured out that ai and technology ethics is uh, is of their domain but that's something that in order to get into this like and, and the whole this rating discussion that we have uh, had over here uh, sustainability reporting is is basically the the source for a lot of information on this one. And w- when we look at the leaders, we have gone through a lot of uh, sustainability reports and how how companies who are using AI in scale, mm. how how they are talking about AI in their sustainability reports. It's very interesting space. Uh, we have a lot of companies who don't even mention a word AI, machine learning, artificial intelligence in the reports. And on the other end. And for example, NVIDIA, um, there are many good examples. Uh, Telefonica was something that I was really excited about uh, just a few days ago when when went through. They have all of these per, like all of these uh, perspectives on table and they systematically uh, put effort on like building policies and, and have, having these policies for managing not only the privacy data security, but also the human rights impact. They know what are the specific risks that are topical for their material, for their industries. Uh, they put effort on the education of the team, the diversity of the teams and so forth. So so this is the this is the space of uh, the sustainability leaders. And, and I think uh, it, it's an opportunity uh, um, that if we get these uh, these folks actually to to call for these different aspects and start to report those those externally as well, uh, we will have a lot of more more information to base our investment decisions from this perspective. Er, do you see that happening in either inside Google or in the news media companies you work with? That this kind of there is this convergence of two different things that Mary brought up, mm. that there's the sustainability expertise mm. and leadership, and then we have the AI ethics. Do you, do you see interesting, strange overlaps or mixes going on, breaking maybe barriers? Well, well the, the barriers definitely are, are broken. I, I think our organization in general is known to be very kind of uh, open and, and data flows has been really open. Mm. Uh, I used to work with very traditional publishing companies, also in, in Turkey and, and, and in Russia and, and so forth. So there the data didn't flow between the organization. And I see this happening in every country. And, and I feel that that's kind of a making the overlaps. People are working together and, and meet, meeting together. So I, I think it, it, it's just becoming more common. And I, I think this our topic today data supported future is like requires these overlaps mm-hmm. to happen so. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we're running out of time uh maybe some i don't know if i can get quick answers from you but from both of you starting with mary and the nero so what should happen next pick one thing what should happen 
Okay, for, for me, it's probably what I talked about. Let's fix the, <laughs> fix the rating system so that we actually uh, start to measure what we are interested about. And, and let's put the pressure on the sustainability reporting. We need to get these metrics in place, the communication about how companies are, are tackling these things. Then we can act, act on based on that one. So that's uh, where I will be very much focusing on. Thanks, Eero. What about you? What should happen? I would look to the leadership. I, I, I think I've seen that there are companies that didn't understand how like they have easy wins to gain. And I mean easy wins that they don't go to the kind of the top class of AI driven company immediately. But there are a lot of things that companies all over the world, uh, they, they don't take the opportunities. They could start saving the, the, the energy consumption or they could do better job for their customers for example, as a publishing industry. So I think the leader should really take a look at, hey, am I following the path? And am I going to take, the, take these small steps forward in the coming months to kind of be more data savvy later? Because we are really early on. I, I think this is like when, when we talk here, we have, we've been living with this movement for years or we think that everybody's actually like really data support, but like mm. most of the companies, they still need to take the first strong steps forward. Thanks. So definitely diversity in that thing as well. Um, but time to conclude, time to wrap up the uh, morning. I made a lot of notes here. I think a couple of things at least I underlined and maybe uh, to continue talking about what should be research and all that is actually the impacts and the causalities of what is going on. I mean, do we know that if something does this, how does it affect that? And not from just a user interface perspective, but from a longer perspective, that how does this shaping of society actually happens? Of course, it's enormously complex and so forth. Uh, other thing I also made a lot of notes about here is what you brought up here in the end about kind of these converging of, of sustainability leadership with the mm. AI and ethics leadership so that, you know, mm. things are happening and maybe certain barriers are, are breaking as well. And then I think kind of as a basic thing, I think there are still some very, how should I say, conceptual research to be done. Uh, what does it mean to be accountable in this kind of a society? What does responsibility here mean uh, rather than being a vague big abstract concept what does it mean how does it become something you know those coders and, and designers and investors and entrepreneurs can actually act upon i think that's you know that's where the rubber meets the road literally and then uh team diversity that was that was brought up as well which i think is a very nice segue uh <laughs> to the next call the talks so uh Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Eero, for this morning. Thank you, everybody who participated in the chat. Thank you for hanging around and listening to this webinar. The next one will be on February 2nd. And the theme will be uh, actually diversity in organizations. So we almost, without a <laughs> hesitation, continue pretty much where we ended up here. So on my behalf, thank you very much. Have a great holidays and stay safe.